Good afternoon and welcome to this 15th uh, briefing from uh, Protector Province, BC. Today is April 27, 2022. Um, the topic today is COVID in the house, protect your loved ones. My name is Dr. Lynn Filiatro. I'm a retired emergency physician and a member of Protector Province, BC. Before I introduce our guests, I want to take a moment to ground ourselves and acknowledge that our team is um, uh, broadcasting from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Salatooth. We are grateful to the Indigenous people who have cared for these lands since time immemorial. We as settlers are committed to do our utmost to uphold the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and work towards its 94 calls to action. So let me start by introducing our guests for today's uh, briefing. First off, Joey Fox. Welcome. So Joey is a professional engineer with training in mechanical, in mechanical engineering. He has more than 10 years experience in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And he's now currently responsible for the HVAC building automation systems at the Adden Ontario School Board. So welcome and thanks for joining us, uh, Joey. Mm -hmm. Next up, I'll be bringing up Amanda, Amanda Hu, who has a bachelor in uh, psychology and a bachelor in fine arts in visual studies. She's also a National Air Filtration Association certified technician and a founder of Fresh Air Schools uh, Alberta. She joins us from Alberta. And she is a member of the World Health uh, Network, which is a global task force um, working on uh, stopping the COVID pandemic. So welcome to you both. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. So next slide. So the topic that we will be covering today is making the distinction between exposure and infection, covering once again what is the main mode of COVID transmission. And once we understand that, what can we do to protect the spread of COVID if someone in our household is infected? And that's where Joey and Amanda will help us understanding what we can do uh, to prevent uh, the household from being infected. So next slide. I like this quote from Joey, which is exposure may be inevitable, but infection is not. It feels more and more now in British Columbia that um, public health has removed every single measure aiming at protecting our um, residents of British Columbia, and that we're each day more at risk of getting exposed to this virus. We at Protect Our Province BC, BC still think it's imperative that we do our utmost to, to avoid getting infected with this virus. As we've seen, it's not just the cold, it can damage just about any um, any of your organs, body organs. And not only that, it can also leave you with a chronic disability through long COVID. So the real goal for this briefing is that if someone in your household brings COVID in the house or in the apartment, what can you do um, to make sure not everybody else gets infected? So next slide. In order to understand what you need to do, we first need to go over uh, again how the virus transmits. Next slide. So from our past briefing with Jose Luis Jimenez and Professor uh, Kimberly Prather, we know that it's a fact, it's not debatable that this virus spreads through aerosols. 
And the aerosols can be up to 100 micron in size. They can travel several hundred meters. And they can, um, and the virus can spread both through short range aerosols and long range. The virus essentially hitchhikes on the par particles that we emit when we are infected with COVID. And we emit these particles by simply breathing, talking, coughing. So this concept that aerosol generating procedures are only in the hospital is false. Simply by breathing, when you are infected with COVID, you can transmit the virus to others. Next slide. We shown this slide before, and it's really important. Essentially, what we're showing here is that when people are close together, if someone is infected with COVID, the recipient or the receiver will get a big concentration of short range aerosol and is likely to get infected with the virus. However, if you spend time in an enclosed space with poor ventilation, no air filtration, the virus accumulates over time in the air. If you think about it as a concentration, the more people that are infected that share a space or a close room, the more activity they're doing that generates virus, such as singing, shouting, exercising, or simply talking. And the more the space is small, the room is small, the higher the concentration of the virus that you will find in the air over time. And even if you are far from the source, if you spend enough time in that close space, you risk breathing in the virus and getting infected. Next slide. I added this slide because it's important to think about that room that I described. So even if everybody vacates the room, if lo and behold, you walk in into a room where people have been um, breeding out the virus for a prolonged period of time in a concentrated small space, you will be exposed to the virus and you can risk inhaling the virus in the air. So this is what this, this slides illustrate and it'll be important when we're talking about mitigation in the household. So now let's Let's go to the next slide. And really focus again on the three main topic that we will cover. That exposure may feel inevitable, but infection is not. That COVID is the main mode of transmission. And what we will learn from our speakers is what can we do to decrease the risk of getting COVID if someone brings it into our house or our apartment. Next slide. All right, so I will leave and we will bring uh, Joey Fox here to help us with the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much. So I'll be speaking about masks and ventilation, so how you clean the air. Now, before I start, I need to say, as soon as you go indoors with someone else, Masks are your best line of defense to protect yourself from COVID. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So this is a background of what you really need to know about masks. So when you look at masks, there are three things. It's the three Fs, filter, fit, and function. So filter refers to how well the mask can filter aerosols. Um, now, surgical masks and respirators both do a sufficient job at filtering aerosols. So they are good masks to use from the filter perspective. The next part is fit, how well it fits around your face. So if it doesn't fit well around your face, the air can just go in through the top and bottom or the sides. So in that respect, surgical masks are actually insufficient 
to properly protect yourself from airborne diseases. So really, all you're really left with is respirators as the proper mask to wear for COVID. The last thing is function, and this is really important. Excuse me. <clears throat> function is about how comfortable it is and how well you can wear it all day. Now, a lot of misinformation has been put out about this. And from my experience, cloth masks, which one, they do not have the proper filter. They do not have the proper fit. And they are also the least comfortable. I know within my family, people were getting outbreaks on their face from cloth masks. And when we switched to respirators, they were much more comfortable. Now, surgical masks are also very good from a functional perspective. It's easy to wear them all day relative to other masks. But if you have a good respirator, it actually is very comfortable. Now, if you look at the bottom right where it shows the fit tested respirator, those are the hard shell cup size, cup shaped respirators. Those tend to be the least comfortable in my opinion. And I think when people think of N95s, that's what they think about. But it's not a completely true picture. Uh, there's a lot of different shapes. There's the flat fold and the ones that fold in half. You could see the different shapes across the top. And those are all sufficient respirators. What's important is that it fits around your face well and it allow, and, uh, allows you to breathe through the filter and not breathe out the sides. Okay, I think we can go to the next slide. So what I wanna discuss here is the effects of masking. So it shows you the time it takes to get infected with the different types of masks. Now there's a lot of caveats that need to be put in here. One, this is old data from the original variants with uh, newer variants with Omicron, Delta and then Omicron. They're much more contagious and it takes a lot less time to get infected. But what's important here is the relative time. So you could see how the N95s, even if it's not fit tested, it's still much more effective than other types of masks by a significant margin. Another piece of information that misinformation that was put out is that it needs to be fit tested. That's simply not true. That non fit tested respirators still vastly outperform cloth masks and surgical masks. Now, you can see the number 26 highlighted. That's the effect of having two cloth masks. Now with Omicron, that number is gonna be much smaller and you could tell that's not a really significant amount of time of protection that you get. The one hour and 25, 1.25 hours, one hour and 15 minutes, that's one way masking. That's when one person is wearing a mask, a proper re a respirator, and one person is not. Does one way masking work? Yes, it does. Is it the optimal situation? Absolutely not. You could see at the bottom right corner where it says six hours and 15 minutes, that's two-way masking. You could see a significant increase in the time. So N95s work. Uh, when they're not fit tested, if there's some leakage, they don't work as well, but they still work very well. But when you have two-way masking, that's the greatest level of protection you could have. Uh, oh, and one more, if we go back, sorry, one more issue I wanted to just bring up. This doesn't take ventilation into account. It doesn't take filtration into account. It doesn't take how clean the air is into account. So in order to get infected, it's all about the dose. It's how much of these aerosols you're breathing in. So if you clean the air, it just amplifies it, the time that it takes to get that dose, and it shows the importance of layered protections in preventing infection. Okay, next slide, please. So, Another bit of misinformation about respirators I found is that they say it's a one-time use thing. And that's simply not true. 3M actually has on their website, you can continue using it until it gets difficult to breathe through, if it gets soiled, dirty, wet, damaged, or if the straps break or get loose. If there's any significant problems with the respirator, then you throw it in the garbage. Otherwise, feel free to reuse it. And telling people not to reuse it might have been thinking, oh, we need to be safe in case something happens with it. But I think it created the opposite problem that people felt it was inaccessible and therefore they couldn't afford them and they couldn't get them and, they, and it wasn't used. But respirators are something that you can reuse. And if you realize a respirator, you can reuse five times and usually it costs around five times as much as a surgical mask, then it ends up being the same cost. 
However, some people can't get access to a respirator, they still can't afford it. So there are alternatives. Now, again, as I discussed before, surgical masks are not as good from the fit perspective. They're still good from the filter perspective and they're good from the function perspective. But as far as fit, usually there's a lot of gaps on the sides of your face. So if you can't get a respirator, the next best option is to use the method called knot and tuck with a surgical mask. Now you could just look this up online and there's videos, it's really not too difficult. But there's a diagram on the right hand side here that explains how to use the knot and tuck method. So first you fold the surgical mask in half. On the ear loops, you make a knot really close to where the mask is. You put it around your face like that. And then on the corners, you could tuck them in and have it touching your face. So that provides a much better fit than just how normally you would put on a surgical mask. So this is an alternative, but it's a second, it's only if you cannot use a respirator, respirator is still the best option. Next slide. Okay, so now off from masks, the next important thing you need to do is clean the air. So when we clean the air, there are two main technologies we use. One is ventilation and one is filtration. Ventilation speaks about bringing in outdoor air. You get infected by sharing air with people. So all you have to do is make sure it's new, fresh air from outdoors that you're breathing in. So that's what ventilation is. Filtration isn't bringing in new air, it's taking the air that's there and filtering it and cleaning it out to remove those virus particles. So even though you're sharing the same air, you aren't breathing in the virus particles. But to discuss ventilation now, there's two types of ventilation. There's natural ventilation, which is opening up windows and air leaking into your house. And there's mechanical ventilation using a machine or using a fan to bring air into your house. So natural ventilation in a house is the most common type, and that's the one you will be relying on the most to get clean air into your house. So it's very easy to just open up windows. Now, in order to boost the natural ventilation, there's a lot of fans in your house, exhaust fans that you could turn on, like in your bathroom or the range hood in your kitchen. So if you're going to turn those on, you should have the window open. So you can open up the windows and turn those on. You could also put fans in near the windows to push air out or pull air in. And those are also ways to increase natural ventilation. So for mechanical ventilation, uh, when you have a, a machine to do it, in your home, it's generally the furnace. So if we could go to the next slide. So this is a furnace. So on a typical home, the furnace actually does not provide any ventilation. So there's two machines here. Uh, one is the furnace on the bottom right hand side and on the top left hand side is what's called a heat recovery ventilator or an energy recovery recovery ventilator, HRV or ERV. So the furnace itself in general just recirculates the air from the house. So if you see the long duct on the bottom left hand side, it pulls air in from other places in the house. It, the air gets pulled to the furnace. In the furnace there's a filter, a heating, heating and cooling and then it supplies air back out to the house and that's how the temperature in the house is controlled. Now, in general, and especially if you have COVID in the house, there's a filter in your furnace and it's best to replace it with a MERV 13 filter or one commonly sold at hardware stores is the Filtrate 1900. Those ones do a good job at filtering aerosols out of the air. The standard filters you have generally are not sufficient. So that's how your furnace in general works. Now in some houses, uh, especially newer houses, there is a heat recovery ventilator attached. So what that does is it actually pulls air in from outdoors. It makes sure that uh, it's heated sufficiently so you're not just put it, bringing in freezing cold air and it puts that in your furnace. So if you have a heat recovery ventilator or an energy recovery ventilator, then you should be running it all the time and running your furnace. And if you have a MERV 13 filter in your furnace, you should also be running it all the time to clean the air and filter it out. But otherwise, it doesn't really help. The furnace is not going to protect you at all from getting COVID. It's not going to do anything to clean the air in your house. Okay, so I think that's it for mechanical and natural ventilation. Now to discuss filtration and specifically the Corsi Rosenthal box, I'll hand it over to Amanda.
Great, thanks, Jerry. Um, so uh, Joey mentioned kind of the two um, first things that we usually recommend. So wearing a well-fitting, well-filtering um, mask, um, and so and then the ventilation part. And so I kind of think of masks as a filter for your face. And so if you are trying to, you know, mitigate some of those viral particles that are coming out of someone's mouth and they're kind of now floating in your space, um, filtration is then the, the next method that you can use. And so as Jerry mentioned, that's about actually taking the particles that are floating around that have come out of someone's mouth who is infectious and kind of pulling them out of the air, trapping them in filters, and then the air that comes out of the, the filter is then cleaned of those viral particles. Um, next slide, please. And so one of the most cost effective and um, you know, accessible options is to actually make your own filter or air purifier. And so this is a design that um, has been used and optimized by a lot of different engineers um, named after uh, Dr. Richard Corsi and um, Jim Rosenthal, who are two fantastic uh, ventilation filtration um, specialists. And so it actually takes those MERV 13 filters that Joey mentioned that you can put into your furnace and you use those furnace filters and you make a cube. And so you can take four, um, there's also some other variations that we'll show a bit later, um, and you actually make a cube of them and then you take a 20 inch box fan and um, tape it all together. And then you put kind of a circle shroud on the top to kind of just optimize the flow. Duct tape it all together as is shown here. And um, it actually works very, very well as a filter. Um, and so it's doing the same job that you might uh, have your, your furnace filter do if you have that MERV 13 or, or Filtret 1900 filter in your furnace, it's pulling air through and then the air that comes through the filter is then, um, is then cleaned of particles. And this kind of does the same thing in lieu of that. And also usually you can put it closer to the source of infection. So the person who is maybe emitting that virus or the room that maybe has viral particles left over, it actually moves it closer to the source of infection. Um, next slide, please. And so you can see here, just um, this is kind of a real life example of putting those together. Um, there's a lot of resources online, um, like the schematic that was just shown. And so a couple of things I like to point out when we talk about building these filters, I think, you know, it seems pretty, um, it seems pretty intimidating at first, I think, to uh, build your own air purifier. But um, once you start building it, it actually comes together really quickly. And um, the interesting thing about these furnace filters is that they always have an arrow on the side. And so, um, you know, one of the things that you should always remember to do is that the arrow dictates the direction of the air. So you can see in one of those pictures that I'm actually showing that air goes through one side and comes out the other side. And that's kind of the way the filter is designed. And so when you actually are building your Corsi Rosenthal box, you wanna make sure that you put all of the arrows pointing inwards because the air is going to go through the filter and then out through the fan. And so you can see there that I'm taping all of those corners together and then putting the box on top. And we've also made designs with uh, circular fans as well um, for other areas of the world where box fans are not as um, uh, accessible. So there's lots of different options and uh, you can see some of them in the next slide actually. So next slide, please. So here you can see that, um, you know, we try to look at different ways that you can even make this more accessible. And um, there's lots of communities online. There's Clean Air Crew and uh, just a lot of different folks who have come together to work on different designs of these accessible filters. And so, um, you know, if cost is a factor to you or if, um, you know, you're having trouble accessing these MERV 13 filters, there are different options for sizing, you know, even if your space is, um, you know, something that, you know, we're talking about smaller spaces. So here you can see um, the original kind of Corsi Rosenthal cube box. And so that has four filters. And so that will give you a lot of air cleaning power. And so you'll probably get, uh, they call them, you know, there's a, there's in the ventilation world, um, you kind of measure how much fresh air is coming to a space as Joey mentioned. And so you, they say air changes per hour. So how many times 
is air actually being completely changed in a space um, and so that you're getting fresh air. And so because you're not actually bringing in outdoor air and taking and replacing it, um, filters kind of, you know, operate as equivalent air changes per hour. So you kind of can build um, all of these different tools together and whatever you have available to um, kind of make your air as equivalent to outdoor air in terms of lack of virus in the air or fresh air as possible. And so um, for this, um, for the cube design, you can probably, you know, you can clean 600 square feet and, um, you know, that's assuming you have eight foot ceilings and that's a pretty standard size. Um, and that'll give you a lot of cleaning power. Um, for, for the middle one, you can see there, there's two filters. And so you actually make a wedge design and you just tape those two filters together, again, with the arrows pointing inwards. And um, that will give you very good cleaning power for 400 square feet. And then there's actually a really simple option that you can just get one box fan, one filter, put the filter on the back of the fan, and that will clean um, 300 square feet quite well. But I mean, it's really just about doing what you can and you know, putting a filter in a space close to the person who's, um, who's infectious will really help to make it safer for everyone else in the home. Next slide, please. And so I spent a lot of time talking about the DIY options, but there's also, of course, you know, air purifiers that you can buy in the store. Um, and that's what a lot of people will use. And um, the main things that we like to just mention to people is, um, you know, sizing is one thing. And um, again, you know, in the home, you're just you're just trying to mitigate as much as you can. And so, um, you know, whatever size filter you have is better than nothing. Um, but there's a really great resource um, from an aerosol engineer, um, Marwa Zatari on Twitter, and you can see her Twitter handle there. And it actually shows you the, the cost per um, clean air delivery rate uh, unit. And so you can actually you know, compare those and um, see kind of which one might be the best option for you. And, um, the 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 thing that we always like to mention about air purifiers is that there's a lot of different technologies out there that are touted and you kind of you see you know what are these all these different technologies and so as joey said the main technologies we recommend are masks ventilation and filtration and so um you know any filters with additional things like ionizers or plasma um you know generating um, things like that are not really necessary and they actually sometimes produce um, kind of these reactive chemicals that then can react in your space and create things that are not that are kind of irritating um, for your respiratory system so we kind of recommend avoiding those um, you know a lot of units come with uv lights and UV is a really interesting anti-germicidal technology that a lot of people are looking into but doesn't really have a lot of meaningful effect in inside an air purifier. So, um, you know, they're not really worth um, buying them. And then if you if you do have a unit with those, just turn them off if you can. Um, and uh, so those are kind of the things that we recommend for, you know, commercial air purifiers. And I, the last thing I'll say about the cleaner delivery rate and sizing for your space is that, um, you know, there's a lot of confusion about what kind of size they say for units. And if you are trying to look for a unit that is sized for mitigating COVID, there's a really simple calculation that you can do. So you take your, you know, the square footage of the space you're looking to filter, and then you just divide it by 1.55. And that'll give you kind of your general uh, clean air delivery rate um, rating that you wanna look for in that unit. Okay, next slide. Um, and so, you know, we just, the, the other kind of technologies that we kind of are adjacent to the, the things that we talked about. So masks, ventilation, um, filtration, including DIY filters like Corsi Rosenthal boxes and um, commercially available HEPA air purifiers. Um, as Jerry mentioned, you can kind of increase the effect of natural ventilation by uh, putting a fan inside the window. And so generally you wanna have the fan um, you know, if you have someone who's kind of isolating in a space, um, you want to have the fan 
kind of blowing their viral particles out of the house and into the outdoors. And so that kind of, um, you kind of see the, if you're looking at the flow of air in a space, you want all of the virus laden air coming from the infectious person to be flowing away from the uninfected people. So blowing out windows, going up exhaust fans, um, and, uh, and then if you have air purifiers to trap the virus inside those air purifiers and filters so that they aren't floating around in the air. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is that with isolation periods at home, um, you know, a lot of the recommendations say uh, five days after your positive test or your symptoms. And we've actually found that a lot of people are um, infectious for quite a bit longer than that. Um, so that's not really based in in how long people seem to actually be contagious to others. And so um, we, we recommend if you can find rapid tests that usually it's kind of a, a test to exit is what the phrase is called. And so it's basically antigen tests, rapid antigen tests will tell you if you still have virus inside you that might be contagious. And so having the contagious and infectious person who's been isolating test, and if they still are positive on a rapid test, that means they're still infectious. And that is um, kind of an indication that you should keep isolating and um, doing all your protocols. Next slide. And so I guess we're gonna bring everyone back now and chat a little bit about um, kind of how this all goes into practice because we've talked about all the tools and it's, you know, there's these ideal circumstances, but then it's also about, you know, doing whatever you can with whatever you have available. And it, it does improve those outcomes for sure. And thanks, thanks, Amanda. Can you, um, we're gonna start with uh, this situation, which is an apartment and it's based on a true case. Can you just orient us and the viewers to the space? Sure. So this is kind of an example of basically a one bedroom apartment um, with a shared bathroom. And so, you know, you might have, um, you know, this would also be kind of applying to, you know, an, a, an apartment that might have two bedrooms, but basically you have to share a bathroom. And that's one of the big concerns is like, how do you, how do you keep someone isolated in a room, but then they have to come out and use the washroom. And then what does that mean for um, isolating from them for the other people in the space? Um, and so here you kind of, you have, or you're assuming that the, the sick person is isolating in the one bedroom. And so the red kind of cloud of <laughs> is, is emanating from them because they're, they're exhaling, um, you know, that virus, those viral particles into the air. And so you kind of assume that that room has, you know, some viral particles. Um, uh, we often recommend, as, as Joey said, you know, that the infectious person could wear, can wear a respirator and that kind of keeps some of their virus actually contained in that filter. And then that actually reduces the amount that's floating around. And then the people who are um, trying to keep from getting sick can wear a respirator. And then that helps filter any remaining particles that are in the air from them breathing them in. And um, the other things that we've uh, noted here is that you can have, you, you wanna open your windows, open as many of your windows as you can. Um, and then you wanna have, if you have a fan available to, to blow air out of the window, that's really helpful. Um, I put in, there's an air purifier inside the space with the person who is, uh, who is isolating. And that helps kind of again, kind of trap some of those particles that are emanating from them, and then it blows out kind of part of clean air. Um, and then the other thing is to, you wanna keep the door closed and um, you know block the bottom of the door um, when they're isolating in the space. And so-, so Blocking the bottom of the door, how would you do that? Um, you can use a towel or a blanket. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of people who, when they're going on trips to hotel rooms, they'll actually, you know, tape the door shut. And so you can do that too. It's just about making sure that the air from the isolation space isn't really shared with the air that is with the people who are not infected currently. Okay. And then what happens when um, they're sharing the bathroom? How do, how do people prevent right. So this is the this is the part when you say, okay, well, this person has to use the washroom or you have to give them some food or um, all of those things. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so as you can see, we've opened the door. And so we want to keep uh, that all of the windows open because you're 
wanting to keep as much fresh air coming in and you know replacing the bad air um, you want to keep that fan going if you have it in the window because it's blowing out all of that virus and it's actually creating a, a breeze that would pull the virus out of the room as opposed to going into the common space um, and you keep the air purifier going. And as you can see, I've left, there's a bit of a trail of, of viral particles because that person was probably breathing out a little bit as they were walking into the bathroom. Um, and while, you know, everybody's coming out, you can, um, you wanna be wearing respirators if, if people can go onto a balcony or, you know, leave the space who are not infectious, that's um, helpful as well. Um, and then, you know, whatever fans you have, exhaust fans, so you might have an exhaust fan um, on the hood of your, your range, or you might have an exhaust fan in your bathroom. And so you want to have those going as well, because that will help exhaust um, the, uh, any of the virus that's in the space. And so that person uses the washroom, and then they're going to then go back into their room you reset everything in the isolation room and then you do want to vent the space and actually make sure that all of the air is replaced before um, the person who's not infected would feel comfortable taking off their mask if they wanted to do that. How much time would you leave if somebody needs to use the washroom afterwards? What What's the guesstimation? I would probably say half an hour. What do you think, Joey? Yeah, that's a good estimate. If you want the math, then uh, it's usually the exhaust fan is one uh, cubic feet per minute per square foot. And then if you want three air changes, it will be a total of 24 minutes, if, assuming a foot ceiling. So um, yeah, 24, three air changes is a 95% reduction in the amount of virus. So if you want to wait half an hour, that's pretty good. Okay, and then the um, maybe the other thing to emphasize is also using the toilet to make sure that people close the lid before they flush. Yeah, that's a good point because um, you know we we use wastewater data <laughs> to uh, monitor viral load in communities, and that's because the virus is in our poop. And so if you're going to use the washroom, you know when you flush the toilet, there is a huge generation of particles that comes out of the toilet, and so you want to keep the lid closed, and that's actually kind of a an aerosol generating um, process as well. So you just kind of treat that as um, that there's viral load coming out of the toilet when you flush. So okay. close the close the lid and then vent the space as well for that. It's good advice for life in general, not just when you have COVID. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's say that um, the residents had an extra uh, filter, either a Corsi Rosenthal or a HEPA filter. Where would you guys strategically place that filter? Um, well, I would probably put, as I say, like you put one in with the the person who's isolating, yep. and then it's good to have another one in the space where, um, you know, the people are, you know, it, it, there's kind of like the red zone and the green zone. And so you want to have uh, uh, one that's kind of capturing all the particles nearest to the person who's creating the red zone, and then another one that is kind of uh, in between them and the people who are um, trying to not get infected. And, um, you know, I kind of think of it sometimes because we've been so, you know, plexiglass barriers have become so ubiquitous because of the idea that it was spread by droplets. And so if I had my way, I would put an air purifier everywhere that there's a plexiglass barrier because it's actually, you know, the plexiglass doesn't stop the the particles that are floating in the air from kind of just floating around. But if you had an air purifier, it would actually be drawing out those particles that you're breathing out and trapping them in and then clean air is being released. And so that's actually in my in my estimation, a better barrier um, than the plexiglass is. I'll okay, say so one point mm -hmm. about the location. So for example, mm -hmm. when we had COVID in my house, my wife was in the bedroom and she had a HEPA filter in the room. We also have, of course, the Rosenthal box. So where I put it was right outside the bedroom door. And okay. that we didn't have HEPA filters for every single bedroom. But any of the viral particles that might have leaked out through the bedroom would then be taken over by the Corsi Rosenthal box. So it adds the protection to all the rooms. So what room you're in is a perfect place to put it. That's They're portable. But that's also another alternative to put it right outside. The best place is inside the room. But if you have an extra one, putting it right outside the room is also a good place. If it's two people and two bedrooms, 
then it's probably best to have one in each bedroom to keep the air clean both. So uh, it depends on the situation, but these are different alternatives you can consider. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so Joey, do you wanna take this one over? Sure, so this uh, discusses how to create a negative pressure in the room. So if there's any air leakage, you want the air to leak into the room from the house and not from the room into the other house. So when you have the window open crack to allow clean air to come in, but there's an adjacent bathroom here. So you wanna keep the exhaust fan on. And what that does is it sucks the air out of the room. So it makes the air less likely to leak through the door. And at the door, you still wanna block it with a towel if you can. And again, it's the same thing over. Uh, a portable HEPA filter with MERV 13 or of course a Rosenthal box or a HEPA filter is you want that in the room. Now uh, it's actually being blocked, but there's a humidifier there. I'd like to just speak about humid humidity briefly. In British Columbia, it's not as important. In Ontario, it's very dry. And having uh, good humidity really helps with mitigation of viruses. You want it in the winter up to around 40%. And if it's below that in Toronto, it gets, you know, 20 to 30 percent, it gets dry. So uh, using humidifiers actually can really help in those situations. Okay. Uh, but yeah, in BC, we're jealous. There's also a warmer, so it's easier to keep the windows open. Um, All right, we'll, we'll send you our rain. All right, next slide. So I think the variation here is there's no bathroom exhaust fan. And... Um, but you do have a uh, a window in the in the bathroom. So what do you do to create that current that you were talking about? So you use fans when you uh, the only way to control the air is by moving it with a fan. So uh, right here it's put in the door, and the next slide is also put into the window. Now all of these uh, slides come from Clean Air Crew. They have amazing information about the Corsi Rosenthal box, about all these isolation rooms, and how you could set it up about HEPA filters, they have really everything. So it's a fantastic resource, the clean air crew. So again, this is a way to, you wanna create the negative pressure in the bedroom where the person is. Now, if they're in the bathroom, it's actually probably better to put the fan right out at the window to be blowing the air out the window. But this is an example, if they're in the bedroom, you, you blow it into the, into the bathroom. Okay, and next slide. Actually, just before we, uh, let's go back one slide. Just one thing we didn't talk about is the air register. Yes, uh, very good point. Uh, the return, so I spoke about the the, filter, the furnace before, that the air gets sucked from the furnace and then gets supplied to the whole house. Now, sometimes it's in every bedroom, sometimes it's one in the main area of the house, but there's these return grills, the return registers. You could, they're, they look, they're square shaped and they have lines on them. So you do not want the air from the room where the, per the infected person is to be sucked out of the room and then spread throughout the whole house. So if you have an isolation room, then you take a piece of plastic, a plastic bag or something, and tape it around the return register to prevent the air being sucked in from that room. Okay, and on this slide, we see uh, another option where you can actually put a fan in the bathroom window. So that's a variation here. Okay. All right. Next slide. Yeah. So this was the precaution because not everybody has um, um, uh, mechanical ventilation in their house. Right. Amanda, um, do you want to speak about this or? Um, yeah, and so I think that this is, again, you know, just, again, it's about exhausting the space out of uh, a window and that it's about, you're creating a, um, as Joy said, negative pressure area. And so if any air is going to move between the red zone and the green zone, you want it to move where it's being pulled from the green zone to the red zone of the, the person who's infectious and not the other way around. And so again, this is just pulling the air out through the open window. And then as Jerry mentioned, you know, if you have, um, you know, gas stoves or, you know, a gas furnace or, you know, anything like that, the, the thing to keep in mind is that you want to make sure that um, there's a window open because if you create too much of a pressurized space like that where you have a negative pressure room it can actually pull um, 
harmful gases from those combusting um, parts of your house um, into spaces where people are. And so that's that's not what you want. So you just, you know, I think it just goes back to the basics of when, um, you know, when, when you find out that somebody is infectious in your house, you just want to open the windows first, um, put your masks on, whatever you, you know, the best fitting, best filtering mask you have, and then you can go from there. Um, I think that's kind of what I, what I always go to when I hear that somebody's um, tested positive in someone's house. Anything to add, Joey? No, she pretty much covered most of that. We've got it. Okay, uh, next slide. All right. So the so really, what we talked about today is that we um, exposure doesn't necessarily mean um, everybody in your household is going to get infected if somebody brings COVID in the house. Um, it all goes back to how the virus transmits through aerosols that basically are like smoke in the air. That's the best way to imagine how this virus spread. So closer to the infected person or closer um, to the red zone, as Amanda was talking about, higher the risk of getting infected. And um, and you want to avoid your entire house becoming a red zone by really um, cleaning the air and and also exchanging the air. And um, and that's what we've tried to do with Amanda and Joey explaining what are the best way to do uh, to do this and uh, taking your own uh, household apartment or home in consideration on how to do th to it best. Next slide. So we've talked about what, what you need in your toolkit. Um, these are kind of the essentials that you need to have. Um, there are other nice to have, but if you can really prepare ahead of time what, uh, a, what a plan would be if somebody brings COVID in the house, then you're more likely to be less panicky about it and better able to execute. Next slide. And we'll bring back Amanda for uh, this bit. I think, um, you know, one of the things I really find interesting about looking at aerosol mitigation is that it can actually be kind of fun and you can learn a lot of things and it, you know, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, scary and it gives you a sense of control in your life um, to be able to have these tools. And so I was, you know, I have this funny limbric, like the virus, it floats in the air, so we must get it out of there. Ventilate your whole space and filter out the place. The air will be safer to share. And so that's kind of where I go to. And um, I think it's um, interesting that we, you know, you just want to have as many tools as you can, and it's um, it's about using as much as you can. And so you can uh, normalize it, have fun with it. It gives you a bit of control. Sounds great. Okay, so let's bring back Joey. All right, so thank you both. I think one of the things I want to clarify, maybe that we didn't explain at the beginning, is the difference between... Uh, mask and respirator. For some people, it may not be clear. Um, and we didn't explain it. So Joey, do you want to do that? Sure. So a respirator is specifically designed to uh, protect yourself from airborne diseases. Mask is a more general term, and it applies to things like surgical masks and cloth masks so that could just cover your face. But to get proper protection from an airborne disease like COVID, you really need to be wearing a respirator. Okay, so really higher grade filtration and and better seal. Are Correct. And the just to clarify, a lot of people aren't sure what a respirator is. It's N95, KN95, KF9. Usually if there's a 90 in the number, then it's a respirator. So that's how you know. Okay, sounds great. Okay, so um, we can bring up some of the questions. How frequently, frequently do you need to change the filters for the Corsi Rosenthal box? Amanda, you want to pick that one up? This is a great question. People ask this a lot. Um, uh, we say generally every six months. Um, it kind of depends on whether, you know, because you can use the great thing about filtration is that you can use it for any kind of, you know, contaminant in your space that you want to remove. So like uh, dust and 
wildfire smoke. Um, that was how I started building Corsi Rosenthal boxes and what got me interested. And so um, you can, for, for viral aerosols, it's probably six months um, before you need to change them. They'll start to look dirty before they are actually fully mm non-usable right like the 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 visible dirt on them does not mean that they're um totally not usable if, because it actually as you know particles go into the filter it makes them actually more efficient because there's more bits blocking up the holes of the filter and so that's actually not a bad thing especially when you're trying mm -hmm. to filter small things like covid um, and viral aerosols. And so there's just a point where there's diminishing returns where the filter gets too blocked up with stuff that it can't actually get air through it. So I would say six months and then, yeah, don't worry if it starts to look dirty. That's just great stuff that you're not breathing that's um, in the filter instead, but your filter's still good for a while. And probably when you're gonna change the filter, uh, go outside, wear an N95. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, you know, it's it's really difficult to say what the the time of how long a virus stays viable on a surface is. Um, but I mean, you know, just to be safe, um, you know, in um, the when you learn, when you go to filter technician course, you learn about, um, you know, um, how to handle filters that do have, um, you know, contaminants on them. And it's just good to, you know, you don't want to be breathing in the stuff that um, got pulled into the filter. So yeah, do it in a in an open space if you can and um, wear, wear a respirator. Okay, and just to um, uh, take the same question, but to the uh, HVAC filter, the MERV 13, Joey, when would you change it? So the Corsi Rosenthal box uses the MERV 13 filters. Uh, in your furnace, change yeah. it based on generally the recommendations. The actual filtry 1900s have a, are just as good as the other ones. So usually I believe it's three months or so. I think it usually says on the, on the filter how often you're supposed to change it. So. Okay, thank you. Next question. Joey mentioned that having humidity greater than 40% is helpful in reducing spread. Why does that help? So uh, you want to humidify up to 40% in the winter. If you start getting above 40%, it's possible to get condensation and then mold growth. It's not good for the house, uh, depending on the climate. And, but ideally for you, 40 to 60%. So not when it's winter, the humidity is going to climb higher and that's fine. Between 40 and 60 is a good value. So there are three things that humidity does. One, the virus just doesn't do that well at, this, at humidity. When it's very dry or when it's super humid, the virus can live a lot longer. But at 40 to 60% humidity, that's when the virus dies quickest. So if you're worried about virus lingering in the air, well, if it dies, then you don't have to worry about breathing in or the technical term is it becomes inactivated. So, it, so 40 to 60% is the best humidity for yourself and the worst for the virus. Now it also hurts yourself. Um, this is not my specialty, I'm an engineer, but your immune system does not do as well when it's exposed to low humidity for a very long period of time. Your body has mechanisms to protect yourself from getting infected with respiratory diseases or respiratory viruses. Um, but when you're exposed to very low humidity, it's bad for you. The last thing that good humidity does is when you expel these aerosols, larger ones will drop to the ground and smaller ones will stay floating in the air. But if it's really dry, the larger ones will evaporate much quicker and remain floating in the air. So it increases the amount of aerosols in the air that you could breathe in. So for all those reasons, humidity, controlling humidity, it's a less known resource. It's not a well-used resource, but it's also a very important resource to help protect yourself from COVID. Great. And also prevents nosebleeds in the winter. All right, next question. Uh, we've been told HEPA air cleaning unit could not be used in classrooms as they would interfere with proper functioning of the HVAC. Any truth to this? Joey. There are special types of buildings called displacement ventilation where there might be truth to that. Um, there are, for isolation rooms in hospitals, there might be some truth. But the vast, vast, vast majority in every single school I've seen, it uses what's called dilution ventilation where it just mixes the, the air in the room. So there is no basis to, to actually say that. That's not true. That for almost every single building in every school I've seen, 
you can put in a HEPA filter in the room and it won't affect anything negatively. It will only help clean the air. Great. I hope. Uh... And I'll just I'll just add to that. That's kind of something that I think a lot of people have been told across the country, um, and that you know we had that similar kind of pushback from school boards, um, you know, uh, in some areas. And you know, I think the Edmonton Public School Board that was a concern that was brought up because of um, you know some advice that was given, and they ended up putting HEPA filters in every classroom, and it it hasn't been a problem. And in in Ontario. Similarly, they have done that too. So I think it's just kind of, um, you know, a kind of information that comes from different places, but I don't, uh, I haven't ever encountered it actually being a problem. Great. Okay, next question. What's the role of the CO2 monitor when isolating someone with COVID in your house? Who wants to take that? I could take it. So... That's not the most essential use of the CO2 monitor. When you are, when someone has COVID in your house, keep the windows as open as possible all the time. What the CO2 monitor does is it measures the ventilation. It lets you know that if there's poor ventilation, it will build up. Now, this it, there are a lot of great uses for this. So let's say you're going to the office or a classroom and you want to see if the ventilation is working properly. Well, you could keep a CO2 monitor and you could get a good estimate of what's happening. But in your house, it will tell you if there is not enough ventilation and it might be if you want to close the window a little and have it as just a reminder that, oh no, the ventilation isn't good. I need to open it up again. But you really should always be trying to keep the windows as open as possible, independent of what the CO2 levels are. But carbon dioxide monitoring is an important thing that we should discuss as a society moving forward to always be aware of how good the ventilation is, especially in public spaces. Okay, great. Um, and I think Belgium has done that already for over a year, have a CO2 monitor in the public spaces. All right, next question. Why do some of the plans of the isolation room have the door to the room block and some have the bottom cut open? Um, I'm wondering if, I'm not really sure necessarily what the question is referring to in our schematics, but I think generally, um, if you have a negative pressure situation, so if you're able to actually have the space where it's venting air out and it's, as I say, the red zone is the person isolating and then the green zone is where the other people are. Um, if you have a negative pressure situation like that, um, you know, it can be beneficial to have the air flowing from the green zone to the red zone. So like if there is a space in the door, but generally I recommend just trying to keep as little air mixing between um, kind of the space where people are isolating who are sick and the space where people are um, who are not uh, currently sick. So that's kind of my general rule. No, I think uh, the specific example was when there was no window. So you turn on the exhaust fan and there's no window. Uh, this happens in, let's say, in a residential building where you can't open a window and the exhaust fan is working. At that place, you don't block the door and you let the air come in from underneath the door. Uh, in the specific example there, I think uh, it came from a clean air crew. It would be good to go to the website and see what the text is. Uh, but... Um, I don't know if the worry is sucking in air from the furnace and that negative pressurization from the furnace can lead to yeah. carbon dioxide. I think I that think might have been the concern and there was no window there. So that's why it was, it was left, uh, the door was not blocked. So air could come in from the rest of the space. Yeah, it was the last example when we we're um, being cautious about carbon monoxide and the pressurization if you've got uh, glass gas stoves or furnace boilers and whatnot so that was that example to um, be careful how you i guess create a negative pressure situation where all the particulate matters from your boiler or your furnace would go including carbon monoxide um, could be dragged into the negative pressure room and but we did have a window in that situation so again being aware of what type of uh, of uh, furnace or um, heater and gas or not appliances, I think is important before we do any of that uh, negative pressure. Um, all right, let me see if there's any other questions. 
All right, older box fans can be a fire hazard if dust around uh, the motor. If on 24 seven, is this a concern? Just asking because wondering if can also use the old fans. Um, I know that the EPA did do a study, um, particularly looking at the fire risk for box fans being used for DIY filters. And, um, you know, they, I can't speak specifically to older box fans, but they, they never, um, the, the, the heat or, you know, resistance of, of the, the fan running 24 seven was never deemed as a risk um, in that report. And so, you know, we get that question a lot, you know, we're making this do it yourself filter. Is it safe? Is it a fire hazard? And um, the resistance from the filters doesn't seem to impact the fan um, any more significantly than the fan itself. And so um, I think the interesting thing about it too is that when you're you're actually bringing in filtered air with no dust um, from those fans or from the, fil the filters through the fan. And so dust is going to be less of an issue um, for fans that are actually connected to a Corsi Rosenthal box. So, um, you know, everyone I've known who has used them, um, they'll have them on 24 seven for months at a time and it's no problem. But uh, I, I would say if you're, if you're concerned about it, um, you know, you should exercise caution, but from the standpoint of the design itself and um, the box fans that, that have been tested, there's, there's really no fire risk that can be seen. I think the bigger fire risk is the heater. The heater right. that if you open the window and you have a, a heater in the um, isolation room, I think there's, um, you know, to be cautious about that. No, but new fans have a fuse uh, in the plug and they're safer. So I would recommend using a new fan for a Quasi Rosenthal box and not an older one. Okay. All right. And I think that's it. Um, I think we'll... we'll um, leave it there. Any parting words? Let's start with you, Amanda. Well, I think it's, you know, I, when someone becomes infected in your household, it's pretty overwhelming. It's frustrating. You, um, you know, uh, all of these tips are kind of not to increase the stress around um, the situation, but to keep everyone as healthy as possible. And, you know, it makes it easier to um, take care of the sick person if not everyone gets sick as well. So, um, you know, the takeaways for me are, you know, if you're scrambling, you find someone is infected in your house, you know, put on your respirators if you can, your masks that are fitted as possible, um, open all your windows. And then if you have an air purifier, air filter, put it as close to the person as possible. And then, you know, you can go from there and figure out what you need to do next to kind of optimize that situation. But those are the three kind of things that I kind of go to right away. And then, and then you just go from there. Joey, anything to add? Well, I think uh, there's been a lot of general knowledge picked up about how this virus spreads and how you can protect yourself. And it's just so important to understand the main tools you have, which include wearing a proper respirator, a good, a good N95 or equivalent. And we have to be have just an overall huge focus on cleaning the air using ventilation and filtration. There's another technology using ultraviolet light. It's not so common in Canada yet, hopefully in the future. But these technologies are really the way forward to create safe spaces and reduce everyone's risk. So this needs to be our societal uh, priorities going forward. Well, thank you both. This was certainly very informative. And we will um, post the resources to our website, including our slides. So thank you both for taking the time to be with us today and sharing your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, with that, we'll call it a wrap.